Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second season of the online colloquium Pluralizing the Anthropocene, re-envisioning re the future of the planet in the 21st century. My name is Gonzalo Santos. I'm a social cultural anthropologist based in the Research Center for Anthropology and Health and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. In addition to being the curator of this colloquium, I will be the moderator of this evening's session with none other than anthropologists Arturo Escobar and Marisol La Cadena, whose transgressive multidisciplinary work over the past decade has been a major source of theoretical inspiration for anyone concerned with environmental issues. Good evening, Marisol and Arturo, or perhaps good morning. Many thanks for joining us. Welcome to Pluralizing the Anthropocene. Before moving on to a proper introduction of Marisol and Arturo's distinguished scholarly careers, I'd like to say a few words about the background of this colloquium, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Let me start with a few acknowledgements. Pluralizing the Anthropocene builds on a creative partnership between uh, several institutions representing the arts, the sciences and the humanities. The Research Center for Anthropology and Health, the Fundação de Serralves, the International Research Network, SciTech Asia, the Center for Functional Ecology, Science for People and the Planet, and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. I would like to thank these institutions for their encouragement and for making this colloquium possible. Many thanks also to the members of the Serhavs technical team for their support. Serhavs is a leading global cultural institution that is well known for its role in promoting public debates on topics that matter to everyone. And there is hardly a topic that matters to everyone than the increasing environmental and climate uncertainties of the present era. The publication last August of a report written by experts from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made newspaper headlines all over the world due to a series of alarming predictions for 2030 that paint a picture of growing environmental and climate disruptions in different parts of the world. This 3000 page report makes it quite clear that while the effects of these disruptions differ from place to place, from social group to social group, what is causing these disruptions are systemic factors that are global in scope and that need to be addressed in the short term to reverse the trend of ruination and avoid compromising the livability of the planet. When I first talk, started talking about this colloquium with colleagues at the University of Coimbra, I wanted to create an open, multivocal and international forum of debate that brought together scholars from different parts of the world and from many different fields. But I wanted to create a forum of debate that remained connected to the larger public. So I invited scholars to explain their vision of what got us into this mess and how to get out of it in a language free of technical jargon. The present decade, the third of the 21st century, will be decisive when it comes to addressing the current environmental crisis. Before we plunge into a conjuncture of chaos, confusion, and rising inequalities even more disturbing that we are already experiencing in the present. I know that there are many people denying the relevance and the urgency of these concerns, but even these people cannot really ignore ongoing debates on environmental destruction, climate change and the future of human life on the planet. These are the biggest challenges of the epoch we live in, the Anthropocene or the age of humans. The term Anthropocene was coined by the late atmospheric scientist Paul Crutzen in a conference sometime in the year 2000 to highlight the role of human activities in climate change. The term was then appropriated by geologists to refer to the present geological era as a period in which humans have become one of the most potent geophysical forces in the planet and their activities leading to increasing environmental uncertainties. There is still no consensus within the geophysical sciences on the date of the beginning of the Anthropocene, but most would agree that the environmental impact of the human planetary expansion has become increasingly visible after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In the last two decades, the term Anthropocene has gained increasing popularity beyond the geophysical sciences, entering the humanities, the social sciences, the arts and the media, 
and leading to the development of critical alternative terms like capital ocene and many other, all of which defined in relation to the original concept of the Anthropocene. Whichever way we look at this concept, the Anthropocene has entered global, cultural and political imaginaries as some kind of hyper object or magnet that helps capture the tensions and the dilemmas of the age we live in. But the Anthropocene is not just about a runaway world of environmental doom, it is also about overcoming disaster and catastrophe and creating new visions of hope and justice. The realities of environmental pollution, anthropogenic climate change, species extinction, and sea level rise compel a radical reimagining of humanity's place in the world, well beyond make-do patchwork interventions like green capitalism. The colloquium pluralizing the Anthropocene is an attempt to develop a more inclusive and di diverse understanding of the challenges ahead. Using the term Anthropocene to refer to the current age of increasing anthropogenic environmental uncertainties has started new conversations about what needs to be changed in the global economic system. But it has also generated a monolithic understanding of the Anthropocene as a unified human experience. The framing of the Anthropocene around the universalizing species paradigm has an homogenizing effect that hides significant exclusions and inequalities. Not all humans are equally implicated in the major forces driving contemporary human environmental crises, and not all humans, and hardly any non-humans, are invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. The second season of Pluralizing the Anthropocene features scholars in the humanities and social sciences whose work is strongly committed to a more diverse and inclusive understanding of the challenges of the Anthropocene. Every talk will be followed by an informal conversation and Q&A session with the audience via the chat function. The chat function is currently closed, but it will be open towards the end of the talk. If you'd like to ask a question, please prepare your question and have it ready to be posted in the chat box once the Q&A session starts. This talk will be conducted in English, if you need language assistance, Microsoft Teams has a live transcript function that can be activated by pressing the live transcript symbol that should be located at the right in the right bottom corner of the application. Please bear in mind that this event is being recorded by Sahavs and will be later released for public viewing via the internet. But let me go back to the main reason we are, why we are all here. In the opening conference of this colloquium, the French anthropologist Philippe Descola argued that coping with the challenges of the Anthropocene requires changing the engines and the navigation system of the global modern economy. In the second conference, Indian historian Rowan de Souza approached the paradigm shifting nature of the challenges posed by the Anthropocene from the perspective of the field of environmental history. In the third conference, multidisciplinary scholar of performative and visual cultural studies, Mayakovskaya proposed a critical approach to the Anthropocene as an aesthetic paradigm. In the fourth conference, anthropologists Jun Jung and myself revisit the global history of the modern flush toilet from an environmental perspective. We drew also on historical and ethnographic research in China to show that it's possible to envision a more regenerative vision of human waste management. Today, we have two brilliant anthropologists with us, Arturo Escobar and Marisol de la Cadena. They will make it clear that the challenges of the Anthropocene require not just moving away from the capitalist paradigm of infinite growth, but also moving beyond the limitations of modern ontologies and epistemologies. It is a great honor to have Marisol and Arturo with us today. Arturo is an activist researcher from Cali, Colombia, working on territorial struggles against extractivism, post-developmentalist and post-capitalist transitions, and ontological design. He was professor of anthropology and political ecology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, until 2018, and is currently affiliated with PhD programs in design and creation at the University of Caldas in Manizales, Colombia, and in environmental sciences, Universidad del Valle Cali as well in Colombia. His most well-known book is Encountering Development, the Making and Unmaking of the Third World, 
recent books include Designs for the Plurivals, um, Radical Inter Interdependence, Autonomy and the Making of Worlds, published in 2018, and Plurival Pluriversal Politics, The Real and the Possible, published in 2020, amongst many others. Marisol de la Cadena was trained as an anthropologist in Peru, England, France, and US. Her work brings together the fields of anthropology, science, and technology studies, and other related fields of research in the humanities. Her first book, Indigenous Mestizos, The Politics of Race and Culture in Cusco, Peru, is an historical and ethnographic analysis of race relations in the Andes. Her most recent book, Earth's Beings, Ecologies of Practice Across Andean Worlds, published in 2015, reflects on the intriguing crossroads where modern politics and history and Earth's beings and the ahistorical meet and diverge. It is an ethnography concerned with the concreteness of incommensurability and the eventfulness of the ahistorical. Marisol's current ethnographic research focuses on cattle ranches, peasant farms, slaughterhouses, cattle flares, breed making genetic labs, and veterinary schools in Colombia. Thinking at divergent BioGeo interfaces, she is interested in the stuff that makes life and death across landscapes and landscapes in a country that itself struggles beyond war and peace. Marisol and Arturo, I'm truly delighted to have you here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Arturo Escobar and Marisol de la Cadema against terricide, making rights of nature pluriversally. Arturo and Marisol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Gonzalo, and thank you very much to everybody that has made this possible. And thank you, Arturo, for inviting me to share the screen and the word with you. Um, I think that what I'm going to start saying will be sort of a repetition of what Gonzalo uh, has already said, but from a different angle. So, um, but before I start telling you uh, what um, we have planned uh, for you, um, there's a little bit of a format that I want to tell you. I'm going to talk first for about 20 minutes. Before I start talking, I'm going to set my timer. Um, and then Arturo will start, uh, will continue uh, from where I stopped. And then I'll come back again, and then he'll come back again. So it'll be um, back and forth between Arturo and I. And we have a script, but this won't be a uh, red talk. We will talk from our ideas and from the script that we have been working on for the last week. So, uh, and we have changed the title a little bit, although we keep the, um, we keep the main ideas from the title that Gonzalo gave. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my timer. Uh, I am going to talk about the limits of knowledge and the knowledge, the limits of the knowledge that we have, what we call knowledge, and why um, this can be an opportunity, why the limits of knowledge can be an, an opportunity. Um, it can change us, it can oblige us in a different way. So um, we are facing, we what we're facing now is um undeniable destruction i mean we have two days ago or three days ago we just heard about omicron right um and we're scared by it so it, it is destruction at a planetary scale that we are um facing and again by the example of omicron um the mutation of coronavirus, of this coronavirus, we are facing um, the discomfort of epistemic impotence. And Arturo and I want to talk at these crossroads, at the crossroads of destruction 
and epistemic impotence. A very anxiety provoking, anxiety provoking uh, crossroads. Uh, and we want to talk at this crossroads because we feel it's urgent um, and because we want to see if we can relationally, well, I would say rhizomatically, but I don't want to use an overused term, relationally, that is all of us together and through the multiple channels that um, these platforms uh, offer us, think uh, together uh, or motivate, feel the, mo the urgent motivation to slow down usual thought, that thought that is feeling impotent right now, slow it down, don't adhere to it, uh, but slow it down and in that slowing down, try to provoke another types, not one thought, not one kind of thought, but open that impotence up to the possibilities of uh, other kinds of thought. Uh, thought built with other grammars, altering grammars, altering the grammar of thought. Um, in thinking, thinking, thinking through other grammars, the grammars that copy editors usually correct, those are the grammars that uh, our inner, we have to correct our inner copy editor to provoke other grammars. Uh, grammars that, um, grammars of thought, I'm talking about grammars of thought, which is also, of course, grammars of writing and feeling. Uh, grammars that are refractory to binaries in teleologies, immediately refractory. No binaries, no teleologies, not even saying, I don't, I don't, I don't want binaries, but that emerge without the binaries. Uh, grammars of thought that do not seek unidirectional solutions, but solutions, unidirectional solutions, but instead of seeking those solutions, breathe life. Those grammars have to breathe life, to be breaths of life. That's what those grammars have to be. And grammars that do not want to translate into itself foreign languages. And that does not want to know those foreign languages foreign languages as a conqueror, but wants to know them as a friend. So knowledge they want, these grammars, but not the same knowledge, a friendly knowledge, a knowledge that doesn't want to make them be what the usual grammar of thought is. And that said, I have to confess that I do not like the idea. I don't feel comfortable with the idea of pluralizing uh, the Anthropocene or whatever it is. Uh, to my mind, and this is probably because I'm, I'm becoming obsessed with um, what we need to change, it seems too analogous to multiculturalism, but from an epistemic point of view as well. Uh, it is like the, that pluralization, and this is where I think I feel repetitive with what Gonzalo said from a different angle, uh, it feels like a multi-epistemic, multi not necessarily multicultural, but multi-epistemic entry point to many ways of knowing as a conqueror the same actor. And it is challenging because the actor may be one, uh, but the w I think that we have to resist the temptation of knowing that one actor through the same knowledge, through us, only one actor. Perhaps the actor is not only one. Perhaps if lo we look closely, uh, the actor is not only one. So, um, in terms to, to talk about the uh, Anthropocene have proliferate, right? In addition to those that Gonzalo mentioned, uh, there is uh, the series of notions that the authors of the shock of the Anthropocene list, right? Thermocene, is the word used to narrate the political history of fossil fuels and energy, right? Panathocene, the word that they use and the chapter that they dedicate to talk about the history of the determining role of the military in the Anthropocene. 
Then uh, the Phagocene, a history of making the consumer society. Agnotocene, a history of the intellectual constructions that make it possible to ignore and marginalize all warnings of climate change. And then we also have, of course, um, from um, a multi-species feminist entry point, uh, plantation scene and Chulu scene, and then the SDS, Latour Stengers, think, thinking through Gaia. And, but except perhaps for the last three, Chutulu scene and thinking through Gaia, uh, so those two. Um, Arturo reminded me of one that has not emerged yet, and it is telling that it hasn't emerged. You said patriarchanocene, pat right, Arturo? I cannot remember, but I think it was that term. So except for those, even patriarchanocene, they all seem to rehearse the same they, they seem to rehearse what we know as world history. One world, one history, one geography. It's a history of the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene, sorry. Uh, uh, and, and that's fine, that's not wrong. But it seems to us insufficient if we want to do what I said when I started this, which is motivate the urgency of slowing down usual thought and search other grammars. So those terms that analyze the world history of the destruction of the planet are fine, it's not wrong, but they are insufficient. And not that we'll get to the point where we will find what is enough, but so far, we have to search. We we have to search for other ways of becoming acquainted with what with what's going on, and perhaps feel that we will never know what the worlds are about. So, uh, a term that I feel, and this is only um, a trial. Uh, we're thinking through this. We don't have, we, we are not offering to you what we just criticized. That is the term that will do what we want uh, the term to do, that the term that will tell us how it should be. But we want to give it a try uh, to thinking um, what will happen if we start with not knowing. In a term to start with not knowing uh, is what perhaps is the idea of world multiple. World multiple is the title of a book edited by an um, uh, anthropologist Atsuro Morita and other colleagues of, of him in the University of Osaka in Japan. The title derives from um, an imaginary conversation between uh, Anne Marie Mon and Merin Strathern. And it alludes to complexities of practices, and this is something that I'll repeat practices uh, uh, where entities can be more than one, but also less than many bodies or, wor or worlds. So the world multiple draws from Anne-Marie Mons body multiple. It uses it to think world multiple to, to open up the possibility of more than one, less than many, where the, that dynamic between more than one, less than many um, opens room to unending possibilities, never ending possibilities, so that it challenges also the our need to apprehend and know. OK, but uh, before I continue with that, I want to um, remind you that the world multiple, the word multiple opens up the possibility to more than one, less than many, slows down 
our drive to apprehend because the more than one, less than many continues in many directions. And at the same time, so that's that's the, the main, the immediate idea when we think multiple, more than one, less than many, impossible to apprehend. But the word multiple also wants to remind us of the force that makes all these more than one, less than many, also singular. So the force that makes that impossibility of knowing that fractalization of practices of entities hold together. It makes that singular, it holds it together. So the word multiple is a really great analytics of complexity. It opens up shutters to multiplicity and at the same time reminds us that oh, there is a force that makes it one. So I think that Anthropocene multiple works a bit better than uh, pluralizing or Anthropocene in the plural. It fractalizes the current crisis and reveals more than one and less than many destructions. It reveals their fractal the fractality of the destructions. And it also makes us think about the fact that they are made singular. So, what Anthropocene multiple does is that it reveals the Anthropocene, the concept, as the forceful concept that is useful to denounce the destruction. So it's uh, a denunciatory concept, but it is also a concept that has the power to make that destruction singular. It has the power to hold that destructions, that shattering of destructions, hold them together, for example, as environmental destruction. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Anthropocene multiple works, right? But it also, it works because it, both denounces and it enforces its own mind to tell us about environmental destruction and make of all destructions a singularity, even in all their fractality, it holds them together. And that is where we want to intervene, even as or because, or what we want to do actually with the notion of multiple. So Anthropocene, multiple or not, belongs to the same genealogy of Thermocene, Plantationocene, Capitalocene. It can be thought through the same world history. Um, but still, uh, if it's held in um, intention as multiple, Anthropocene and perhaps the, all the other things, can open view of what we're calling destruction multiple. And I consider destruction a better te a term than Anthropocene if destruction is willing to not translate itself into uh, languages of life that exceed the genealogy to which it is attached. So if destruction is not willing to become to lend itself to singularity, but to open itself to be shattered by the might of the Anthropocene, the Thermocene, the Capitalocene, by the might of the forces that are provoking that destruction. And if destruction uh, is allowed to do that, if we can think about destruction multiple, that resist its singularization, 
the idea of destruction multiple can show the destruction of what we do not know. We know that destruction there is because we are told that, for example, trees that are also persons are being destroyed when forests are destroyed or mountains, as in the case that I was exposed to and I witnessed, uh, that are being destroyed by open pit mining are not only mountains, but also beings, earth beings, I, I translate them as such. Uh, if destruction is willing to open, to reveal the destruction of what we do not know, and accept that we do not know, but we accept that it is being destroyed, then destruction multiple can serve as, um, as an entry point to talk about what's going on that exceeds the limits of what we know. And not only as the coronavirus exceeds the limits of what science knows, but the excess that is refractory to modern knowledge and that modern knowledge does not even want to conquer because to modern knowledge, that excess is not. So, um, in looking for how to talk about what exceeds modern knowledge that modern knowledge does not allow to be and that modern knowledge cancels because it cannot be like trees that are persons or um, mountains that are beings in searching for how to approach that i have resorted to inspired by Mary Strathern to a practice of what I call, borrowing her term, Mary Strathern's term, negativities. And so, for example, I talk about the anthropo not seen, in which seen, you write, you write seen as S-E-E-N, Anthropo not seen. The human, and I should have called it anthropo not being, the person that became human because the person that it was could not be. And I'm thinking about, for example, <coughs> where jaguars, the ones that, the, the entities that Eduardo Kwan talks about, or um, earth beings, or humans that are with earth beings, and that cannot be because that's not the human that we are. I'll continue with that afterwards. My 20 minutes are off, and I'll um, now listen to Arturo without interrupting or perhaps interrupting. Arturo, your turn. Um, can you can you hear me? I'm trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me? You, you are. An, you, yes, we yes. can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay. My microphone appears as, as as muted. Well. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Gonzalo, Marta, for the invitation, Joao, everybody at the foundation as well, and Marisol for uh, sharing this space. We've been doing some presentations together, and it's always wonderful to think with Marisol. Thanks for the very 
fascinating introduction, Marisol. And I'm going to start by restating very briefly some of the main points that Marisol made in my own understanding of them. And so Marisol is inviting us to think about thinking again, to be newly mindful about how we have been thinking with binaries, with teleologies, with rationalizations. So colonizing other ways of thinking. And so also is inviting us about how do we think again about uh, making visible all ways of making life uh, that do not conform to the modern epistemology. How do we uh, think about those ways of life, making life that are more relational and pluriversal and in a pluriversal way as well? And how do we become newly aware of how our own modern ways of being and knowing and doing, including modern social theory in the academy, have engaged in the destruction of these other ways of wording, ways of being, and especially then how do we begin to dwell in a different sort of space that Marisol called pluriversal contact zones in the second part of her introduction, a concept that we've been working on as well together, and also been attentive to the eruption of what cannot be, the eruption of what cannot be uh, according to the modern ways of being, modern ontology and modern epistemology. And we could talk a little bit about how what's going on in Latin America today, especially over the three years, with the massive demonstrations and protests, in many ways can be described as a new kind of eruption of what cannot be according to the modern rules. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this first part, about four new beginnings or beginnings for thinking in a different way that I found, and some of them I've been discussing with Marisol, others with two good close friends and colleagues, Michal Osterweil and Kriti Sharma, with whom we are writing a short book, which is called Designing Relationally, Making and re restoring or restoring and restoring life, placing life again through a different narrative, in a different narrative, co constructing new narratives about life. And there are four of them that I'm going to mention it here as an invitation for all of those, for all of us to consider in our own uh, reflections about the Anthropocene and beyond. The first one comes from somebody who that many of you probably know already, whose name is Bayo Akomolafi. Bayo is a Nigerian psychologist, philosopher, post-activist, as he describes himself, who is creating a really wonderful set of spaces, collaborative spaces, uh, for really doing what Marisol was calling for, for a different way of thinking, the thinking that is pluriversal, that takes place on different sort of spaces than the only the space of the academy or the space of activism as conventionally understood. So Bayou begins to ask the question, what would happen if the ways in which we're thinking about climate change and are themselves part of the problem? And so his invitation is to, for us to entertain the idea that climate change is not a problem. Climate change is the world that we inhabit. And why does he say that? Because this is climate change is so amazingly complex that cannot be contained within any way of thinking, at least any way of thinking that we know, and probably no way of thinking that we know as well. So it's infinitely, infinitely, infinitely complex. It is ontologically unframable, incalculable, and unthinkable. Those are his terms. And we haven't really taken full notice of that, of the fact that that complexity cannot be captured by, especially by logocentric ways of thinking, which is the ones that we mostly practice in the academia and in intellectual and activist life. We cannot fix climate change. So we like a series of notions from other authors that I'm not going to summarize here. 
One of them is that we are entering a fourth advent. Advent, the first three were the origin, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and then the origin of human consciousness and knowledge. The fourth one is one in which we are today, within which the rules of knowing that have applied in the previous in the previous eras no longer apply. So his question then is how then do we what do we do about this? How do we organize? And how do we organize as well? Um, and, and then without bearing in mind that conventional ways of organizing are no longer uh, sufficient. So he, and, and I'm just going to give you some brief ideas about his answer to the question. One is thinking about the cracks, going into the cracks, into the cracks, going into the cracks of what is thinkable, going into the, into the cracks where we find what is unthinkable, what is mysterious, what is ineffable, what is what we can only gather through intuition and the senses, but not only through rationalization and radical rational thought. Concepts such as on to epistemic fugitivity, how do we practice a kind of fugitivity in relation to those ways of thinking and being human in which you are contained and trapped, uh, the concept of post activism and transraciality. And he gives a prominent space to the role and the domain of the sacred and the spiritual and making sanctuary making sanctuary for life and for all other ways of being and thinking that are emerging worldwide. So another beginning, he's calling forth as well. He says it's not going forward, but going upward. And going upward, I think, goes very well with Marisol's emphasis on, on the world multiple. The second one is the concept of terricide, terricide, terricidio. And this is being coined by the indigenous women, the South American indigenous movement, the South American movement of indigenous women for buen vivir, for collective well-being, for a different way of understanding life. And they invite, they are inviting us to build what they call a new civilizational matrix, a new civilizational matrix based on buen vivir, based on a different understanding of what life is, a relational universal understanding of life. And this, I'm going to quote this very short. They say, this is mostly, this is come from Moira Mijan. Moira Mijan, she's one of the main uh, originators of this idea of terricide and the movement against terricide. She says, we are summoned by the memory of our ancestors and by the lands and landscapes that we inhabit. Uh, and then we have agreed on the creation of, of the movement of peoples against terricide. So summoned by the memory of ancestors and the land and landscapes that inhabit us. Already there is a displacement. It's not thinking from the space of thought, accumulating historical sediment in the space of thought, or not only, but thinking from the earth, with the earth, with the land, with place, with locality. These are new concepts that are not easily accommodated within the space, sort of the ontopistemic space of modern social theory. Moreover, I find the notion of terricide much more, um, how, would we, how would I say, appropriate to convey the phenomenology of the destruction that we're witnessing today that the Anthropocene, without wanting to suggest that the notion of the Anthropocene is useless because it's not, it is very useful. I mean, we're engaged in this interesting debate because of the notion of the Anthropocene. But the notion of the Anthropocene is still it seems to me, and even this, the multiple pluralization seems to me they lend themselves too easily to managerial, technoscientific, anthropocentric approaches to solving the crisis. It lends itself too easily to a certain will of mastery and control of enlightened humans, enlightened man, when the enlightened man obviously is the man of modernity. So there, what is emerging today, if we take this notion of the terricide seriously, is the earth itself. The earth itself has, is becoming the most important social actor, social uh, epistemic actor today. And in between the world or the multiple ways of worlding, and especially the hegemonic way of worlding, and the earth, 
there emerges a vast space where thinking can be given another chance or multiple other chances to thrive in different ways and in different directions and according to different genealogies and histories. So we have this vast space of narratives and uh, where new narratives are emerging and new ways of thinking are emerging as well. And this is the point of departure of the third source that I wanted to mention. And the third source, and I apologize, this is all going to be very schematic, comes from a Chinese philosopher of technology whose name is Yuk Hui. Yuk Hui, many of you have probably heard about him already. Hui, uh, who is, comes from Chinese and East Asian philosophies, post Heideggerian philosophy as well of technology. He begins with the following question. This is from his book, Art and Cosmotechnics, his last book. He says, how should we respond to the challenge that the human has, on the, has undertaken to eliminate its own conditions of existence? The challenge that the human has undertaken to eliminate its own condition of existence. And of course, this is not the human in general. This is a particular kind of human that he's talking about. And it's not just something that happened, it has been a process of humans on designing. Okay, second point that he makes is that in between the triumph of modernity, especially the, through technology, and the meltdown of modernity that we're beginning to witness, there emerged a new condition for philosophizing or for thinking in general. So a new condition for philosophy, a new condition for thought, and it's not just one new condition. There are multiple beginnings, and he's very clear about that. Uh, almost anywhere in any pluriversal contact zone that we can envision, and especially in those that pit groups of people around environmental conflicts that are also ontological conflicts around mining and so forth, or Marisol was talking about in relation to mountains, that in almost any of these situations, there is a new beginning that is emerging, that is arising, that are particularly important ones as well, that are beginning to become more visible. So his call is to go beyond the algorithmic rationality and the calculate, calculative rationality of modern science and technology, particularly technologies and artificial intelligence that are overshadowing even the possibility of being through uh, through the organic, through the earth, and through a, a more emplaced and embodied kind of human. And um, so his call is for new uh, relation between art, philosophy, and technology. He gives a lot of importance to art because art is able to be in touch, and he's talking mostly about East Asian painting in this particular case, is more able to get in touch with that that is unthinkable and and uncomputable and incalculable or incomputable and incalculable, what is ineffable in life, a new cultivation of sensibility that he's calling forth that is important for building a new cosmotechnics. Uh, of technology and of society as well. Um, and so that's, that's uh, and art as the space, and we rarely think about art, but there's so much that is happening in the world of art that is completely defined as pluriversal art and as strategies for pluriversalizing as well life and the world. Okay, and the last one, this is going to be very short, uh, it could be a very long explanation as well, comes from a Jamaican philosopher, Sylvia Winter. Some of you might be fam familiar with her work. Uh, and she starts with this question, where have we been in ontopistemic terms? And what have we been? And the answer that she gives to that is historically speaking, is we have been contained or inhabiting what she calls a mono-humanist notion of the human, a model humanist way of being human that she describes as a way of being human in terms of it's, it's a liberal, secular, Western and bourgeois and rational, individualistic and so forth way of being human. 
And we have to extricate ourselves from that way of being human. We have to work through it. And this is the way of being human established since the Renaissance and the conquest of America through modernity and then modernization, development and globalization. All of those processes are involved in the making of this modern human, the making of man. You know, this is very similar to Foucault's man. And, uh, and hence, to the possibility of moving towards a different horizon for the human, which will have to deal with the question of artificial intelligence and technology, but that will also uh, be based on the fact that, that the human is not just biological, the human is not just bio, bio, a bioeconomic species, the human is also a species that knows and narrates its, its own existence. Is the human is homo narrans, the, the, the human that narrates and brings into, into existence new ways of being, new ways of, wor new ways of worlding through their imaginized imagination and their designs and their making. Um, so these new stories, and with this I conclude and I'll pass it back to Marisol. Um, this, this, um, this four um, interesting, to me, very interesting ways of thinking about new beginnings for thinking, for thought, can be a part of what we invent in terms of imagining new narratives of life, new stories about life, uh, just even designing new conditions for being human. And uh, when we, in the second part of my intervention, that is going to be shorter because we don't have the time to do it with a more extended way, uh, I will want to share with you a particular new narrative of life that we see as emerging from Latin America today from the activist spaces over the interface between the academy and social theory on the one hand and activist spaces in Latin America today. Okay, so now it's back to Marisol, please. Okay, first I have to tell you that I was not present for part of your um, presentation, Arturo. Something happened to my connection. I don't know if you realize that. But I, I, I think I sort of know what you said. Anyway, yes. um, uh, going awkward. That's something that I, I want us to keep in mind. Um, Bayo Komolafe is a new fellow traveler that we have encountered, uh, and with whom we think um, ways of going awkward. Um, uh, I, but I, what I want to uh, resume um, with is the notion of terricide. And the notion of terricide because uh, one of the things that the current destruction makes very visible and undeniable is that uh, the earth is the space that is being destroyed. Uh, what is being destroyed on the earth, we might not know. That's where worlds inhabit. So the earth replacing the idea of world as the place of inhabiting and the earth as a place of life rather than world as a container. Earth is being destroyed, terricide. Uh, and I think that that goes very well with the notion of destruction multiple that I was starting to talk about, but uh, in which I really did it said um, a lot about it. Uh, we don't. We do not know what's being destroyed. I was saying that we have to invent ways of not knowing, but becoming aware of what is being destroyed, and that what I, um, the way I provoke my thought, my own thought, and offer these as a, as something that people can use, is the notion of negativities. Not knowing is one of them, anthropo not seeing or anthropo not being, to think about the human uh, the, uh, other than monohuman that Sylvia Winters was talking about. And that also replaces the notion of human with the notion of, of person rather than human. The human is the what we know, 
the person we might not know, the person multiple, that can be shared also with what we call other than human or non-human. So destruction multiple in these negativities, uh, I want to pair that with a call for awareness about our inhabiting what we are calling pluriversal contact zones. Uh, this is hardly a new concept. Uh, contact zones is a notion that Mary Louise Pratt coined like 30 years ago. Right, uh, and she coined that, that notion to talk about encounters. Encounters that she didn't say among worlds, but she was talking about encounters among worlds. All we have done is update that notion a tiny bit, or rather update is something I hate. Locate that notion a little bit in places to look at how the contact zones are places of encounters of worlds that inhabit what's being destroyed, the earth, but the destruction of which emerges as a multiple locally. So pluriversal contact zones are zones of encounter of divergent worlds that inhabit the earth. In pluriversal contact zones, pidgin languages emerge, but that are not, when we talk about pluriversal contact zones and encounters among worlds, we're not talking about an encounter uh, from which a third thing emerges, but an encounter among n worlds that diverge and that continue to be the same with the encounter and also self-different. They encounter what they are not, they continue to be who they are, but because of the encounter, they are also different. And this is also similar to what Eduardo Viveiros de Castro calls equivocation, controlled equivocation, being aware of controlled equivocation. And I quote Eduardo also to, and Sylvia Winters and all those that we're working with, to speak resomatically, also to undo the notion of practically and do the notion of author. Yes, it's my mouth, but through my mouth, many people are speaking. So um, these contact zones, pluriversal contact zones are zones of encounter. Uh, from in which complexity emerges as analytics also for us, the analysts, the ones who are trying to figure out what's going on. People leave it complexly indeed, participating in more than one and less than many worlds and practices. What I want us to think about when we talk about pluriversal contact zones is several things. One is that in these zones of encounters, entities are very obviously more than one and less than many. And I'll give you a very brief example that I always give. <laughs> and it is the, the my witnessing a demonstration and what I thought was an environmental demonstration, a demonstration to defend a mountain that in which environmentalists like myself and many of us perhaps uh, would have participated. I was participating as an environmentalist and people with whom I was living and working and learning from. My friend and mentor, Nazario Turbo, who made me realize that this environmentalist demonstration was not only such. It was instead a pluriversal contact zone where earth being was also mountain, where mount mountain was also earth being. It was not only one, it was 
not many. Uh, it was a complexity that through which worlds had come together. Examples of these are enormously present uh, in, in the news right now. Uh, they even make it to uh, constitutions. Rights of nature is not just an emergence uh, or a term coined by environmentalists. It is a, a term coined by environmentalists that have been working with uh, indigenous leaders and that speak in the language that the state can understand. It is very important to think that the state, the state has a modern language. But because the state has a modern language, it does not mean that, for example, something that it can understand that like rights of nature, constitutionally written, can be space for a pluriversal contact zone where awareness of the many worlds that are and then the many entities, sorry, the many entities sounds better in my uh, speech right now. Uh, the many in entities that are being destroyed can be felt. What I think uh, we're trying to do is produce vocabularies that simply facilitate awareness of that which we do not know, perhaps cannot be known, but is and is being destroyed as part of terricide. Uh, when we offer these vocabulary, when we offer that grammar, we don't want to displace either Anthropocene or uh, Toulousine or Capitalocene. We want to add to it. Practice of subtraction is overrated. I think we have to practice addition, critical addition, critical alliances, practices of alliances when we have interests in common that may not be the same interest. Like in the case of, um, again, the demonstration, the environmentalist demonstration that I participated in, the mountain to me, Ausangate, the earth being to Mariano Nazario, was the same interest, was sorry, was an interest in common, but it was not the same entity, but it was an interest in common that brought divergent worlds into a con the demonstration as a contact zone. So pluriversal contact zones um, is, uh, are sites where we can feel destruction of that which we cannot know and that can provoke the can help us practice forms of knowing that are not that do not want to conquer that want to become friends i think that that's something that um it is a different practice of knowing. I don't know a friend to conquer him or her. I know a friend to know to be with that person. I don't have to have certainties about who she, they are. I just want to be together. I want to live together. Forms of knowledge that do not want to conquer, but that want to um, be together. Arturo, I'm going to leave it there for you to continue because I talked longer than you before. And now you're uh, muted. Okay. Yeah, I'm having trouble unmuting myself. Can you're, you're, you're muted now. 
Okay, my my icon, my image with the microphone is still unmuted. Is it still muted? I'm sorry. Well, okay. So thanks, Marisol. I wish you could have kept on going, but I understand the time limitations. Um, I'm going to start. It's going to be a brief intervention, hopefully. I want to start by going back to something that Marisol mentioned at the beginning of her second comments, talking again about the human. And that reminded me of a concept that we found in a wonderful uh, indigenous intellectual from the Brazilian, from Brazil, from the Amazon, whose name is Ailton Krenak. And Krenak, somewhere in a text, or in an interview maybe, he mentions the concept of the ex-human. It doesn't matter the details, just what is stayed in my mind is this idea that besides and beyond and next to maybe, or as a complement to posthumanism, maybe even transhumanism, but especially posthumanism, we might consider something we might call ex-humanism. How Sylvia Winter's work has been described as counterhumanism. So it's not just posthumanism and transhumanism, we have counterhumanism, exhumanism. How do we cease to be the kinds of humans that we have been and that we are compelled and designed and structurally designed to be that kind of human, the kind of human that comes with the whole assemblage? of institutions and state and capitalism and heteropatriarchy and racism and so forth. That is modern man, modern man. Okay, so I'll start by a very brief quote that the first time I read it had an impact on me. And I wonder if it might have the same impact on you. He's, the author is not very well known. He's a, theologian and ecologist whose name is Thomas Berry, North American, he was a priest as well. And he starts one of his essays from the late 1970s in the following way. It is all a question of a story. We are in between stories. The old story, the story of how the world came to be and how we fit into it is no longer effective. Yet we have not yet learned the new story. The only story he says has become a dysfunctional cosmology. Mm -hmm. That's the story that has created the Anthropocene, among other things, slavery, uh, enslavement, uh, destructions, destructions multiple, uh, and it's no longer the story of the Earth. So where are we going to find the new stories? because there's going to be obviously multiple new stories. There is never going to be one single story, one single new paradigm, one single new general theory. I think that's the, the, the historical moment in which we thought that was possible, possibly naively, and we in the academy is far gone. But uh, so where are we going to find the new stories? And the new stories are emerging from so many different places. And sometimes they begin to crystallize and coalesce for particular historical reasons. So this is a hypothesis uh, that I'm going to tell you very briefly about a new, possibly a new story of life, new narrative of life emerging from, especially from Latin American activist practices in some engagement with academic and theory and social, modern social theory as well. And, but it's a story that's emerging in complete contact with dominant stories about life, about technology and science and the individual as a, in a pluriversal contact zone that, that is shaped very much still by that other story of life, the anthropocentric story of life, the story of life that says that the world is inert, that the universe is inert and that it is not a living cosmos. The one, the story of life that leads to extractivism and rationalization and calculation and is based on the individual. We can, we understand that story very well because it's a story that we are, it's a story that we inhabit, especially those of us who inhabit the liberal walls of the middle class in the cities of the world and 
there will be much more to say about that, but let me leave it at that. So the story is articulated. I mean, this is my obviously our abstraction of what's going on. Very complex social, historical, political process among social movements and collectives in terms of six concepts. The first concept is I'm just going to mention them and then say something super brief about each one of them. And then how they operate in pluriversal contact zones. The first concept is territoriality. The second is communality. Communality is the neologism. The third one is autonomy and the production of the common. The fourth one is re-existence. The fifth one is transitions and transitions to the pluriverse. And the last one is politics in the feminine. Politics in the feminine. This is from Latin American feminisms. So the narrative goes more or less as follows. It's a different narrative of life. You can have in your head what the dominant narrative might say about each one of these aspects of life. So it basically says we, because it's a collective we, it's never an I, an individual I, we exist in territories and territories are the spaces of existence and the territories involve obviously all everything that is present and part of life, humans and non-humans and spirits and so forth. We are also communal beings, communalidad. We construct ourselves nosotricamente, in a we way, in a we way. We abide by the need to live in interdependence, in web of interdependence with everything that is in life, other humans and non-humans as well, or more than humans. We strive for a degree, a measure of political ontological autonomy, because autonomy is the only possi possible way in which we can guarantee, to the extent that it can be guaranteed, that territoriality and communality are going to be important forces in what we do in our lives. We strive not only to resist, but to re-exist, to continuously recreate the conditions of our existence in the context of what is going on in our, based in our places, but in the context of what is going on in our regions and so forth. We also aim, and this is obviously from more organized social movements, to foster transitions to a world where many worlds fit which is the Zapatista definition of the pluriverse, to that world that Marisol described very well, in which we can really relate uh, under conditions of equality and respect with all other ways of working. And finally, <clears throat> our politics has to be an anti-patriarchal, anti-racist politics, a politics in the feminine, a politics in the feminine, Meaning by that, a politics that is centered on the care of life, the care and the healing of the web of life, and the care of the production, the reproduction of what is common, and the regaining of the autonomy over the making of life. Okay, so that's more or less the narrative and the concepts that are emerging at the interface, again, between the academy, social theory, and social movements, pro political processes. Um, there is a sociology of that production of that knowledge in many sites and places in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. How they function within pluriversal contact zones, and Manisol has given an example, examples. Uh, especially, these concepts have been emerging in acute situations in which environmental conflicts um, around, for instance, around uh, the destruction and defense of rivers and forests and mountains and seeds and commons and even the 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 uh, uh, digital commons in which those struggles for the defense of those commons of those earth beings uh, can be understood as ontological conflicts and are understood as such because when this this other narrative of life story of life that begins to coalesce uh, intellectual and politically in so many practices and ways of being, um, then that is, is, is immediately set, uh, relationally activated to be a narrative that 
in, invites people to organize in particular ways and to think in particular ways. Okay, and obviously in the context of, of the dominant way of being, that's why, for instance, the example that we give around the rise of nature, like the rise of the rivers, is once at instances in which the state capitalism can, in a way, meet halfway with movements from below that are ontopistemic uh, movements based on relational worldviews, in which, for instance, the activist says that we are the river, we don't exist without the river, the state doesn't understand that language, but you understand rights of nature and rights of the river, and there is a rapprochement of, of in a way, between those different ways of worldview. Okay, I stopped there because I took a little bit longer than I wanted. Thank you. I, I, Thank you can I so say? much, both of you. I mean, we went a little bit beyond time, and in order to make sure that the audience still has uh, time to ask some questions, uh, Marisol, would you like to just add something very quickly? Or I, I, I wanted to add two words. Okay. I think that uh, uh, what Arturo said last opens up pluriversal contact zones to politics, politics yeah. inhabiting pluriversal contact zones where these uh, story, this way of storing through territoriality, communality, autonomy, politics in the feminine uh, transitions and re-existence can coexist with the a politics of activism as environmentalism, for example. Environmentalism can end uh, territoriality and communality, can share and can share in mutual uh, complex we's that do not, that exceed each other, that do not necessarily know each other in the ways in which we are used to knowledge. I'm not saying that we have to not know in the way we know. I'm just saying that that is insufficient, that there are other ways that we, that we have to cultivate other ways of knowing, that are knowledges for life, that can become part of pluriversal contact zones with knowledge as usual and engage in a politics uh, for life, for life, where life is what is the goal. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of, uh, this last comment really goes uh, in the same direction of one of the questions that I had during your intervention. It seems it seems to me that the notion of uh, pluri, pluri, pluriversal contact zones can be certainly used in, I suppose, many different ways. I, in your presentation, I, it seems to me that you seem to point in two different directions. So one is kind of using pluriversal contact zones as a kind of an analytics that help us um, familiarize with things that uh, are not even taken into consideration uh, in, in hegemonic narratives to talk, for example, about destruction. Uh, I mean, Marisol, your, your thoughts on destruction multiple and Anthropocene multiple were, uh, were illuminating in that, uh, in that respect. I mean, most uh, most natural scientists talking about the Anthropocene, their narrative of destruction is going to be very different from the narratives of destruction that we can find in many different uh, in many different contexts outside the academic sphere, in which you know what is being destroyed is not necessarily uh, a species, and what is being affected by destruction, it's not necessarily a different level, you know multiple variables uh, that can be measured uh, regarding air, land and air systems and so on and so forth, um, but that are things that are not even taken into consideration within those academic spheres. And so we need to kind of learn through engagement with these pluriversal contact zones uh, to, to take into account um, those things outside the box that were not taken into consideration. So in that respect, the notion can be used as, as an, an, an analytics to expand the scope of what is actually being discussed and what we mean when, say, 
someone like Anand Singh, anthropologist Anand Singh, talks about the, ant the Anthropocene as being patchy, as being heterogeneous, and as in your, in your terms, as being multiple. But sort of my question is, how can we deploy pluriversal contact zones into a politics of knowledge multiplicity? I mean, that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my challenge. I mean, how can we sort of institute spaces of pluriversality to help people of different backgrounds sort of engage, engage with, um, with that which is not known? Right. I mean, do you have I mean, you mentioned some examples in within the field of activism and so on and so forth. Could you talk a little bit about this? Could you share with us some of your example, some examples that you have encountered uh, in your in your activities as activists and researchers? Um, I think Arturo has m much more to say about that uh, uh, than I do, but I Gonzalo, there are plenty. And so Arturo will give you some examples and then I can also talk about others. Is that okay, okay Arturo, well, or I, do you want me to go? Yeah, that's perfectly okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll say something brief and maybe one, a little bit of an example, and then Marisol, you can talk about, you have quite a few examples as well. Yeah. What I'll say is that pluriversal contact zones, it is indeed an analytics, it is a concept, a concept that helps us see spaces, zones of encounter between different ways of worlding that are always entangled with each other. They are never separate and we have come to realize, we've been working on this concept for about only a few months, but we come to realize that, and I think Marisol mentioned it, that they are in a way all over the place. Anywhere we are, we are within a pluriversal contact zone. And if we think, in, in, we think it in that way, then the, uh, we can engage in the creation of a praxis that the result of which is the co-creation of pluriversal contact zones with others. This is what we learn from activists in Latin America and probably activists in many different parts of the world, is that um, inhabiting a site of a struggle, like the ones uh, that against extractivism, against the destruction of forest and mine and, and mountains and rivers and seeds by corporations and so forth, uh, means that these groups are always co-creating, almost co-emerging themselves with the pluriversal contact zones in that they feel they have to inhabit in order to articulate their struggle politically in ways that can, that can be listened to. That doesn't mean that that's all they do, but in my experience at least, and I think probably Marisol has the same experience, Activists do engage with the state, for instance, with NGOs, with corporations at times. Uh, it is, they no longer feel they have to have this kind of purity that, although there are autonomist, radically autonomist trends within Latin American struggles and critical thought that would say no engagement with the state and with capitalism and so forth, but for the most part, they feel they need to engage with the state because the state creates the conditions even for their struggle in many ways and also for living. So it is a praxis. It is a praxis that is always multiple, that, that in which everybody that is engages in that practice is affected to a greater or lesser extent in with the requirements of knowledge and of knowing and of investigation and research that the, sometimes these groups do are quite different from the in research that we do for the most part uh, within the epistemic of the modern social sciences. And one example that, that we were privy to recently in, a, in a, an event that we, we coincided, uh, Marisol and I, with a young 
environmental engineer from a Pacific or Chocó rainforest in Colombia, who was one of the main people uh, in, the, in her community organizing the struggle to get a declaration of the Atrato, Atrato River to have rights. So the river, the rights for the Atrato River. I mentioned that in passing. Uh, and she described very well how their position is that they are inseparable, inseparable from the river. So the key, 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 key uh, grammar here is the grammar of inseparability. Inseparability is a grammar that the state really cannot understand because the state thrives and demands separation between humans and not humans, between river and forest, between the living and the not living, and so forth. So, but politically, for the movement, it was important to voice their full ontology, if you wish, their full relational ontology, their ontology of interdependence and mutual constitution with the river, in order to even get the state to engage with that possibility of the declaration of the rights of the river that was the second river in the world that was that had that recognition by by a state by a government so but it is always a praxis i think it's a praxis that we can think about in our own ways in our own daily lives i think in our own daily lives we all are moving we know we know the dominant story is no longer compelling i found that so much among the young students in the us at chapel hill obviously in Latin america but chapel hill most of the students know they don't want to live according to the script, dominant script anymore, of liberal, even liberal humanism, productivism and rationalization and so forth. But there is an eagerness for other kinds of stories. And in many ways, everybody constructs, co-constructs these stories in terms of the universal, uh, pluriversal contact zones in which we are, find ourselves to be. What is all? So, um... I want to say that pluriversal context zone is an analytics. Uh, it is it is a concept, but it is what I call an ethnographic concept. That is, it is a concept that emerges from the empirical and what exceeds the empirical. I didn't invent pluriversal context zones only reading Mary Louise Brown. I we came up with pluriversal context zones through the help of Mary Louise Brandt and also Donna Haraway in Where Worlds Meet, but also through the engaging empirically with social movements. My witnessing the destruction of Ausangate as earth being and as, um, as a mountain. I wouldn't have been able to think through reversal context zone without that witnessing. Uh, so, uh, uh, and without that participating, I wouldn't because I, <laughs> I would have seen Ausangate only as a mountain, right? And it was the urgency of its emergence as earth being that shattered the only mountain trope. Uh, that's one thing. So yes, it is a tool, but it's a, it's, it is an ethnographic concept. It emerges, it emerges from uh, practices. So I would say that the reversal contact zone is a tool and it's also a practice and the practice where thought dwells or sh where I want my thought to dwell uh, in uh, a dwelling zone, a, a dwelling place for thought. Um, I want to, in addition to answering that, I want to give a very brief example uh, about how pluriversal contact zones can be part of total modern tools like filmmaking. Uh, the other site where I thought pluriversal contact zones was um, watching Forest Law. Forest Law is a film uh, that um, is um, produced and directed by Paulo Tavares, a uh, Brazilian uh, architect and uh, Ursula Biman and Forest Law presents, it's also uh, made by several indigenous intellectuals from Ecuador who make of Forest Law 
a pro-diversal contact zone in conversation with. So one of the requirements of pro-diversal contact zones is conversation. As an analytics alone, it doesn't work because it's us who's, who are only deploying it. And that's not, that is thought as usual. It emerges from conversations across divergence. Uh oh. Te oímos, te oímos. Uh, Marisol, okay, I think it's the internet probably went. Okay. Oh, you're back. Okay. I, we lost, back. lost sort of the last sentence that you said. Could you repeat that? So you're talking about conversation, conversation, right? So how important it is to think about. So uh, the reversal yeah. contact zone is not an analytic zone. It is an analytics in conversation. In conversation. It's not only a, an analytics. It's very different from, let's say, uh, biopolitics. <laughs> um, yeah. Biopolitics or any other um, usual concept. It is, um, and that's why I'm calling it an ethnographic concept. It's not without place. It's, yeah. it is. And it's uh, a relational concept. Place. It, uh -huh. it, yeah. it is exactly. a concept, yes. Yeah. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to say, so uh, what I was saying is, it's not just me witnessing uh, an earth being. That's what we used to call radical alterity. Uh, and that's a notion that bothers me enormously because it reinstates the radicalness of the self in front of the other. And that's something that I think needs to be placed in a conversation in pluriversal contact zones. In pluriversal contact zones, selves and others interchange. There's no radical alterity or it is mutual and it's not radical because there is some communication and incommensurability. So radical alterity uh, only alludes to a notion of incommensurability that I think is completely what has made us different in self, different as a self. We have to think another we cannot cancel incommensurability. It is important, but it's not um, only non-commensurable. It is so commensurability includes communication. It doesn't commensurate, yes. but it, it communicates. Uh, there is communication across yes. incommensurability. So a film can be a site of making the film can be the site of pluriversal contact zones. Um, a trial um a, dis a, a legal discussion about what something is can be a pluriversal is a pluriversal contact zone uh, but I, I want to go to something just a second and i'll finish um uh the state needs separation and capitalism needs separation capitalism yeah. needs nature separate from human it needs to make the relation, the connection between owner and owned. So separability is, is part of the inheritance that we have to otherwise inherit. Not cancel it, but otherwise inherit it. Okay. Yeah. Gonzalo. And that poses an important challenge because, you know, I mean, much of our legal system, I mean, the modern legal system with all its variations from country to country is based on this assumption of separability. I mean, and uh, you, you, you talked during your presentation about a pluriversal transition. You don't really elaborate on that, but if we, if I, I'd like to push you sort of in that direction and ask you, you know, how to conceive something like, say, the rights of nature and the rights of some of the entities that you were talking about, the river, a mountain, pluriversally uh, and um, using a question from the audience Matt French asks related to this issue I am worried that conferring earth rights between quotation marks may support and extend extractivism by mapping modernity's epistemies deeper into non-human realms 
is not is not the best defense for complex environments that they keep or even amplify their mystery. So he's worried that you know by conferring earth rights rather than protecting you know natural entities, you're actually may even um, facilitating extending extractivism. How would you react to this? OK, several clarifications. I'm very picky with language. As I said at the beginning, I think we need to alter our grammars. So when we say transition, it's not a, we are moving towards. We're in place changing. Sure. OK, yeah. so uh, transition to is not something that we're going. Transition yeah. to is something that we're doing here and now. Yeah, all of us. OK, so that transition starts by here and now looking at our, our, our grammars and uh, thinking what we're um, saying. So, and I forgot your second question. What I reacted mm -hmm. to was the conferring. We're not conferring. Um, it has been negotiated. It has emerged. It, it hasn't been conferred by a center. It has been negotiated and results from a center. But I forgot the question, so I'm very sorry. So um, yeah, so Matt is asking, you know, if we're sort of conferring Earth's rights, which we're not, which you're not, um, you know, that this would actually further or would enable, you know, uh, the extractivism. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yes, yeah. it, it might, it might, and it might not. Yeah. Uh, there is no, as I said at the beginning also, we're not proposing something that is going to be uh, a solution. Oh. OK, we lost uh, Marisol again a little bit. The image froze. Perhaps Arturo, let would me, you like to comment? Let me continue on this. where Marisol left. What I would say using a trope from Marisol is that it is about rights of nature, but not only. And they not only makes a huge difference. For the state, it's just about rights of nature, period. It yeah. cannot be about nothing else. But for communities and for movements and for activists, it's also about defending their cosmovision, which is the yeah. local term for ontology, if you wish, the way of life, the way of being. So it is, again, it's an entire praxis. It's a praxis of being able to, activists, for instance, explain it in terms of buying time. Rise of nature helps them buy time from capital and the state, uh, instead of being overrun completely quickly. Uh, explain it as a question of strategy. So there is also there is a bit there is a bit of a Cartesian epistemology there as well at play, but not only that, it's a Cartesian epistemology that articulates with something that goes well beyond that, which is the epistemology of interdependence, an ontology and an epistemology that do not depend on intrinsically existing subjects and objects and actions, but where everything is interdependent. So in that way, it is very different, but the risk obviously is there. At the risk that it's always there because of modernity, ontopistemically and politically speaking, modernity has the upper hand. So we have to see it as a strategies of resistance from below that, that have support in the places, localities and communities and peoples in all of their heterogeneity and diversity and power relations as well. Nobody's saying that these are untouched communities or united and homogeneous. All of that is part of these struggles. But yes, any time that we extend a modern concept to, to worlds or communities, if you wish, that do not abide completely by those modern concepts, there is a colonization of, that, of those worlds as well. But again, not only. Yeah, it makes possible all the dynamics. Arturo, we have a, a very, very specific question just for you. I mean, what was the name of the Nigerian activist you mentioned? Yes, I'm going to let me see if I can write it on, on, on the, the, the chat. 
yeah and what was the um are you writing in chat Um, I think you, you, uh, can you unmute yourself? Perhaps the technical team at Sahavs, can you help me unmute Arturo, please? Can you hear me now again? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So it's so, Bayo, yeah, so, so two laughing. quick questions. So one about the Nigerian activist. The name and the other one about the uh, the notion of terricide that you used for this title. Um, I, I understand, you know, the uh, it's a concept coined by uh, indigenous women, um, uh, indigenous Malpuchi women, correct? Uh, they propose this notion, um, the context of a new proposal of a new civilizational matrix of Buen Vivir, right? Could you tell us a little bit about this notion? Yes, that's correct. So first about Bayo Komolafi, the best way to find him, well, with his name is on the chat box. But if you look for the Emergence Network. The Emergence Network, the okay. The Emergence Network is his main space that okay. he has created. It's really, really wonderful and creative. It's quite amazing. And the notion of terricide, let me just, Marisol is calling just a second. Just a second. Hola. No te puedes volver a conectar. Hola. Hola. No puedo entrar. Uh, te, si quieres lo dejo prendido aquí entonces. Si quieres oír. Estoy tratando de conectarme, pero no creo que. Ya estoy. Ya, ahora sí. ¿Ya entraste? Yes, I, I can see you, Marisol. Ah, bueno. Okay. Okay, but uh, can you turn on your camera? Yes. Hi, hi again. Sorry, yeah. So we were just talking about about the notion of Terisai, the question from the audience. Um, and I'm afraid it's going to have to be our last question, actually, because we, we went over time already. So the Terisai? Sure. And how does that okay. connect to or Terisidio? Yeah, Terisidio, how does that connect to the pluriversal contact zones? Perhaps okay. uh, Artur first and then Marisol has the last word. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. So very, very briefly, yes. You look. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, but okay. I cannot see myself. It's fine. We can see you. We can see you, Marisol. Okay. 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 It's a it's a concept that was proposed by the South American Indigenous Movement for Buen Vivir. Let me see if I can. No, I have to unmute myself. When Marisol speaks, I'm going to unmute myself and type on the chat box the name of the movement and the main okay. person who is okay. who is Moira Mijan. But she's Moira just the, Jan, the okay. most the main person. She's very well known. So start. Oh no. <laughs> okay, so this time was Arturo. Shall we? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll right, take so over. Maybe for you a take second. over. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll take over for a second. Okay, okay. so I think that Terry sign, um, um, one of the things that the current destruction has made obvious is that all worlds inhabit the earth and that uh, it's uh, the earth that's being dis destroyed. Um, 
so your question is how is Terry sign um, a, a notion that, um, and this is a great question, uh, a notion that can lend itself to think with pluriversal contact zones. So let's think about Terry site multiple, and then destruction appears as multiple. Uh, and it appears as the, the emergence of multiplicity is what makes a contact zone. And a contact zone among uh, divergent worldings is what a uh, pluriversal contact zone is. And it, the notion of terricide also invites to alliances in, across uh, divergent worldings to defend the Earth. Uh, and it may leave open the, um, or it may, it may provoke the need to not know what is being destroyed in order to provoke alliances. So the problem with politics as usual is that in order to make an ally, you have to know in the usual way of knowing uh, what you are becoming an ally for. With the notion of pluriversal contact zones and the idea of interests in common that are not the same interest, what you have to identify is the interest in common. It doesn't need to be the same interest. And what you need to negotiate is how to maintain that common interest in a way that will satisfy all participants in the alliance in the same way. So, uh, and I think that Terricide is, uh, m shows the urgency of the destruction and it may open itself, open up room to breathe a different way of knowing. I think Arturo is there. Yes. I'm back. Yes, you're okay. back. Arturo, would you like to um, to continue where you left? Um, no, I just had no? because one we sentence. still have one final question. If you perhaps you want to answer to this one, okay, it's in the chat. Why box. don't you ask the question? Yes. Okay, so uh, it's from Mayakovskaya. Uh, she says, um, moving, inspiring talks. Thank you both. Can either of you expand on the modalities of a politics of knowing as one seeks to know a friend? I'm thinking I'm thinking of Schmidt's deeply problematic notion of politics as division between friends and enemies and the divisive us and them dualism it turns on and binary that it produces. Clearly, neither of you is advocating stoking dualist div divisiveness. So given the intractable specter of multiple forms of violence in this politics that embraces knowing, not as mastering or conquering, but as recognition of irreducible worse beyond the self in that friend, how do we politically engage with, with violence with, uh, with repli without replicating the errors of Schmidt's binary? I think that I enemies there are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that enemies there are. Um, and the problem and, and the problem is that those enemies do not want to not be enemies. And that's why the uh, it's more urgent than ever uh, to make friends among those that do not want to see themselves as enemies that are willing to see themselves as potential allies, even if they are political adversaries. Uh, although I think when I think about and the space of environmentalism, I can see adversaries among, let's say, um, uh, different strands of environmentalism. And the challenge is for those adversaries to be willing to become allies because the enemy has the might of destruction. 
So perhaps uh, we, uh, what we're not doing is thinking friends or the space of allyship as a monolithic, nor are we thinking the space of enemies as a monolithic. What we're not doing, and that shatters the binary because the fractality runs across both sides. But um, we are not saying that enemies are not, that, that there are not enemies. There are enemies. And there's an enemy that does not want to. Let's say that this enemy does not want peace. Pass. That enemy doesn't want pass, doesn't want peace. This enemy wants to conquer. There is an enemy. But um, the the field of friends is not monolithic. There are adversaries within the field of, of friends, and it is it can become uh, an important field where um, discussions happen, opposition happens, but they are negotiated and to become to make it possible to defend life against death yes. so it's not um in that sense uh it shares the conundrum that schmidt saw life versus death but it's not uh the the moment is completely different to begin with what we're doing is not practicing um a <laughs> We're not practicing, we're not proposing liberal politics, which is what Schmidt was wrote against. Uh, the we, conflict is uh, central to our thought. We're not proposing um, ecumenical peace. We're proposing a practice where peace is constantly achieved. And it has it has an enemy, it has had an enemy, and it's a mighty enemy, um, and not one that will allow for an easy defeat. So I think that we, the, the division between friends and enemy um, that we talking about is not Smith's division. But it's a good question, one to think through, uh, and one that I think we should all be invited to think through, if uh, we want to, of course. Arturo, would you like to uh, make some final comments? OK. Um, or uh, yes, either in sorry. response to this question or perhaps uh, in connection to the previous question on Terry's side. Okay, I'll, I'll begin with this question. Because I'm I think sorry it's an important to interrupt, uh, Arturo, you have to turn on your camera, otherwise I can't select you. My camera. Oops, I don't know why it's off. Now it is on? Oh, yes. No. Thank you. Okay. So. I actually prefer the concept of adversary that Marisol was using, mm -hmm. which is the concept that actually Chantal Mouf uses yeah. in her more recent work, as opposed to enemy. Even if in Chantal Mouf, the notion is still insufficiently relational. And so that's the first point that I wanted to make. The second point is that, the, I mean, this is such a question that is so vividly lived in Colombia right now. And in several Latin American countries that are faced with very momentous presidential elections and Congress elections very soon, just happened in Chile, just happened in Argentina, it's going to happen in Colombia in a few months. And 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 which is the question of in 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 places like Colombia or Mexico, where there is an enemy that is bent on destroying that is bent on controlling, that is bent on having peace, that is bent on appropriating and destroying all other possible ways of worlding 
because it's a hegemonic. It has been, but it no longer is. And it's losing its power, but it's willing to use that power to crush and to massacre. So is it possible to think about a politics without enemies? And I think that's the greatest challenge for politics today in theory and in practice. I usually say this is an open question in political ontology. How do we do the politics of relating with those other worlds that do not want to relate, but only colonize and destroy and impose themselves? So but in the context of Colombia, I think there is a hopeful situation that is happening because the main left alternative coalition is definitely making the case for the first time in Colombian history, I believe in this way, that uh, their movement is a movement that is built without enemies, that without even those right-wing fascists will not be enemies, but will be, this, I mean, they will be held responsible and so forth, and they have to defend themselves and protect themselves. But in principle, they are emphasizing the politics of care and the politics of love in relation even to those that do not want to the peace. And finally, that to me, it makes so much sense because if we, if we take seriously the idea of interdependence and radical relationality as the foundation for life, then radical relationality suggests that we are all entangled with each other in different ways, in multiple ways. And if so, there cannot be enemies. There can, on, there can only be if we bring forth the world together with others always. The only possible politics is the politics of care or the politics of love. You find expressions of this in many people in all, before, in Gloria Saldúa, in, in Humberto Maturana, Francisco Varela, in feminist writing today about care, the feminist, the feminist theories of care uh, are very much about that. So that's what I would say to end my part at least. Thank you so much. Marisol, would you like to add something? If not, I will conclude this session. But uh, if you would like to add something, one minute, no? No, I think it's, I, I think that, uh, yeah, Arturo rounded up. Uh, what I would say it is that, um, it is an enemy that doesn't see itself as an enemy also. It sees itself as progress. It sees itself as mm -hmm. uh, the common good. Yeah. And it commonizes. And the colonization is destruction. Many thanks both of you, Marisol and Arturo, for your wonderful contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. Truly inspiring talk and a great discussion. Artur and Marisol have introduced a whole new language of talking about, or perhaps effectively moving beyond the Anthropocene. Terricide, destruction, multiple, anthropo, not seen, pluriversal contact zones. There's a lot of stuff here to think about. Please join me in thanking Artur and Marisol for the pleasure of their company and their wonderful contribution. Before you all go, let me just remind you that the next session of Pluralizing the Anthropocene will take place this Wednesday already, so in three days, um, December 1st at 6 p.m. Lisbon time. We will have the pleasure to host distinguished STS scholar Kate Crawford, who will talk about the environmental implications of contemporary infrastructures of artificial intelligence. The event is free. But registration is required. Please register at the event's webpage in the Sahab's website. And many thanks once again for your support. See you again soon on Wednesday. Bye bye.